In this lesson, we'll continue with some of the current research using optogenetics to help trace the engram, to uncover the engram, the, the physical biochemical substrate of memory. Now, we have in previous lessons learned about the amygdala as being important in fear conditioning to atone, for example. The hippocampus is critical for contextual fear conditioning. Techniques that interfere with memories of the context of a shock do not affect the memory for a tone shock association. Lesions or optogenetic silencing of the hippocampus, for example, can block fear to the conditioning chamber, but the fear of the tone that was paired with the shock will remain. This is because the tone shock engram is stored in the amygdala, while the context engram is stored in the hippocampus. And we saw this a little bit in a previous lesson then. So these two important brain areas here are making different kinds of contributions to, in this case, a memory for an event. A, a tone paired with a shock in a certain context. The amygdala is instrumental in making the association between the tone and the shock. The hippocampus is instrumental in making the association of the, the bad news happening in a certain context. To create a fear memory for a context, the hippocampus sends contextual information to the amygdala so that a context can be associated with the shock. Thus, the entire fear memory must include the hippocampus and the amygdala, where the context can be associated with the shock. The tone shock engram is not affected by manipulations of the hippocampus, as we've seen. Now, let's look at a series of experiments using optogenetic techniques to help track down the engram for a memory. In this study, researchers tagged the hippocampal CA1 cells that were allocated to the fear memory for context A prime. So by tagging here, we mean we're, they're inserting those uh, light-activated channels. So here we see the, the three cells out of this population are going to be the engram for the fear memory to context A prime. The animal was put in this cage and it was shocked, and now we have an engram for that fear memory and these cells are now controllable with light. Next, they trained the rat in context A, a very similar context. And the question would, it was, would a similar population of neurons be allocated to the fear memory for context A? So the fact that these are very similar cages, uh, would it be that the, a very similar overlapping population of cells would be allocated to the fear for context A? That was one of the questions. I'm showing the overlap here by having these two cells be part of the fear memory for context A, and, but those same cells are part of the fear, fear memory for context A prime. Finally, context A prime neurons were silenced while the rat was tested in context A. The rat showed impaired fear memory. Because of the overlapping representations, silencing the context A prime neurons also silenced context A neurons, and so interfered with the memory retrieval for context A. So again, consider the testing situation. We're testing in context A. That should be activating the engram for context A. Here's the fear memory for context A. But at the same time, they were silencing the A prime neurons. That was this engram over here. Oh, but wait, two of these cells are also shared in the context A memory. So by silencing the A prime neurons, they were interfering with the reactivation of the fear memory for context A. And this does show that very similar contexts have an overlapping neural representation. Now, we said earlier the hippocampus was good at pattern separation. So there are some unique uh, uh, patterns of cell activity for these very similar representations. But if you can silence enough of a memory representation, you can interfere with the retrieval of that memory. Consider another experiment. Researchers tagged the hippocampal CA1 cells that were allocated to the fear memory for context A prime again. Next, they silenced those same neurons while the rat was trained in context A. So you see, now they're going to they're gonna tag the neurons and insert the, the, the light-activated proteins in context A prime. So here, these cells will be the engram for A prime. But now they're going to silence those very cells while the animal is now trained in context A. Okay, so now, would a different population of neurons be allocated to the fear memory for context A? 
So you see, by silencing the A prime engram cells, uh, the researchers wanted to know whether the brain would be forced to allocate other neurons for the fear memory to context A. Would there be non-overlapping representations then? Because you were already, the researchers were silencing the engram for A prime. Silencing engram neurons, neurons for context A prime did not interfere with the acquisition or expression of a different fear memory to context A. Silencing A prime neurons forced the new memory to be allocated to a different set of neurons. So by silencing the A prime neurons, it was forcing the brain, in a sense, to use other neurons to encode the memory for the fear of context A. And then when they were tested in context A, uh, they had a, a fully normal fear response to context A. Finally, let's take a look at an experiment that was designed to answer the question, could scientists create a false memory in an animal? So here we go. We have uh, cells in the dentate gyrus, and these cells are going to be responding in uh, unique ways to different contexts. So on day one of the experiment, they put the animal in context A, and this will be known as the safe context, so a certain population of cells will respond to context A. And then they allowed those cells, so the context A cells, to insert the light-activated proteins, so they uh, will now be controllable with light later on. So we've got context A is safe, and the engram cells for context A are now uh, light-activated. On day two, now this gets uh, tricky here. So on day two, they're going to put the animal in context B. Now uh, it's a different context, so we would expect a non-overlapping population of cells to respond, right? So we've got context B cells, but then the animal is also shocked in context B. So the red cells are going to be forming a fear memory to context B. But while they were doing this, they were shining the blue light, activating the context A cells as well. So we've got A cells are activated, B cells are activated, the animal's getting a shock. They wanted to see whether they could create a false memory, that they could get the animal to fear context A, which was safe, simply by pairing the activity of the engram A cells with a shock. On day three, they put the animal back in context A, and sure enough, they found a fear response. So now the activity of the A cells was a part of a fear memory, even though the animal never experienced a shock in context A. What they experienced was context B, but they had the context A cells artificially stimulated using the optogenetic technique. So the animal never got a shock in context A, but it's now showing fear to context A because activity uh, of those A cells was paired with the shock, even though that training occurred in context B. When you put the animal in context C, uh, they get no fear, presumably just a different set of uh, uh, cells are activated here, but those uh, cells were never associated, never linked with uh, shock. If you put the animal uh, in context B, now remember it was trained in context B, there was a, a shock in context B, you do get a fear response, but it's reduced. And scientists think that perhaps there's some competition there because you'll recall in the training episode, co context A cells were also uh, activated. So it may be that the association of the A cell activity with the shock was somehow in competition with associating the shock with the B cells as well. Nevertheless, there was somewhat of a fear response in context B. And if you simply put the animal in context C while shining the blue light, thus activating the engram A cells, you get fear because now the A cells have been linked with the shock and so the animal expresses a fear response. Again, even though the animal never experienced a shock in context A, you can get them to show fear by simply reactivating those uh, engram cells in whatever context. In this case, it was context C. So, it seems scientists were successful in creating a false memory. And this again shows the power of optogenetics. It's a very, very interesting tool. It allows scientists to gain control over just those cells that seem to be allocated to an engram, allocated to a memory. And by using this technique, scientists are, are closing in on a much deeper understanding of how brains make memories.